All right, I just want to introduce you to myself and to this channel. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Zubin Pratap, and I thought I'll just share with you in this video a little bit of my history, how I went from being a 37-year-old lawyer to a software engineer at Google and Chainlink and stuff like that, and give you a sense of the history and just how long this entire story has taken to unfold, okay? So I was born in 1981. And, you know, you can do the math as to how old I am now. I was I grew up in India in the 90s and I went to law school in 1998. I finished high school in 98 and, and went to law school at a, at a very good law school in India that, you know, had about 30, 40,000 people, I don't remember now, applying and about 60 or 70 of us got in based on a competitive entrance test. And I was lucky because I grew up in a privileged household in the sense that I had an excellent education very loving parents, though I was the child of a single mom. My mom was a very hard worker, very successful in her career, but very much a salaried employee, you know, and so on and so forth. So I grew up in that kind of environment where we were always taught, do the best you can at school, study as hard as you can, get a good job, keep your head down, you know, definitely go for your goals. But all, you know, it's, it's about pursuit of academic excellence and then hoping that you get a great job and you get to hold on to it. Because in, in the 80s and 90s, the world in India was very, very different. And being raised by a single mom in 1980s India was very different. But my mom is perhaps the most heroic person I've ever met and truly a, an inspiration. So I was very fortunate. I grew up in a very loving household and I think that gave me a giant advantage in life as did the kind of education they put me through. So, you know, quite a bit of luck there when you think about the fact that I didn't choose the family I was born into. But I did have to do a very competitive entrance test to get into law school and to be honest, I was kind of scraped through. I was on the wait list I think it was number six on the wait list and then, you know, other people dropped out and, and, and so I, I made it in. And that was a really important formative period in my life because between 1998 and 2003, which is the, the period in which I was in law school, the whole world changed, right? 98, Google wasn't a thing. The dot-com boom had barely started to take shape. And then by the time I came out in 2003, the dot-com boom was over, the dot-com bust was over. Google was actually known to the world, more or less. By that point in time, I think Gmail was still by invite only. You know, back then, there was no YouTube. There was certainly no Facebook. You know, some, it was just a, a very, very, very different world. Email was still starting to get reasonably mainstream and everyone is using Hotmail or Yahoo email addresses. So, you know, the whole world was quite different. And I was very much caught by that momentum. So 2003, I got myself an internship at the UN in Austria and I went there, spent, you know, about six months. That was a fantastic experience, really one of the most global experiences I had and learned a lot about leadership and um, things like that. And I was very young at that point in time, so I was quite lucky. Anyway, after that, I moved back to New Delhi in India and I started my practice in as a litigator, which means I went to court in, in Delhi, which is the, the capital city of India. And it was a wonderful period of time, but I was rapidly getting disillusioned in my first two to, two to three years of um, litigation. I don't think it was right for me, you know, and, and it became quite clear to me during that time that it wasn't quite right for me. And then that was what prompted my first career change when I moved in 2006, after about three years of practice, to a corporate law practice, which meant that I was doing a lot of contracts, negotiations, mergers and acquisitions. And, and at that point in time, I worked for a really great law firm with a phenomenal team and I learned a lot. And that was perhaps my first real big lesson as to how much just how much the team around you matters for your success, for your well-being, for your motivation, for your engagement with the topic, and for your growth. And I learned tremendous amounts from that team. It was really a special time. And a special time in Indian history as well, because I was working on some deals that were, you know, in the middle of two, the 2000s, a very special time in Indian aviation history, and I was an aviation lawyer for a while there. And then after that, I got a very lucky break with, a, with the global law firm, and I asked to be in the Melbourne office, which was fantastic. Again, wonderful people, and the kindness of relative strangers to give me the opportunity. And I moved to Australia in 2007, still very much a lawyer, at that point in time a corporate lawyer, and just in time for the big global financial crisis. Now, most of you who are probably watching this were not around or certainly may not have been in the workforce in 2007 to 2010, which was a brutal, brutal recession. It was a really hard time. Keep in mind though, that technology hadn't yet reached this fevered pitch that it's at now. It was a different world, dominated by bank banking and construction and some manufacturing and things like that. And the financial crisis hit a lot of people very, very hard. A lot of people lost a lot of money, lost a lot of their savings, uh, pensions, retirement funds, and so on. And a lot of people lost their jobs. There was blood in the water everywhere and it was tough. I barely held on to my job and I was highly motivated to do so 
because I was still on the work visa and I did not want to get kicked out and have to leave the country or find a new job in 30 days. That was rough. That was a second massive lesson in my life, the importance of career management and of being able to look around corners in order to always have plans for the worst for your future career, which takes a lot of discipline and skill. I learned that the hard way at that point of time. I was actually working at that point of time in General Motors, though I was seconded there as a lawyer. It was a fantastic experience, and I'm grateful to the people there for giving me that. But keep in mind, General Motors filed for bankruptcy at that point of time in the US, and so the world was a very, very difficult and different place back then. But I worked on some phenomenal things that helped my resume look good, gave me fantastic experience that you know really helped. But around this time, I started thinking, hang on, there's this big tech boom that's going on. These startups are you know going crazy, and Facebook was starting to go mainstream. Instagram wasn't quite a thing at that point in time. Uber wasn't a thing. Dropbox wasn't a thing. Airbnb wasn't a thing. Y Combinator was starting to get quite known. Very different world, right? 2010. Anyway, at that point in time, I realized, hey, I think I really want to get into this tech thing, but I had no idea what to do. I wasn't good at math. I didn't think I was ever going to be smart enough to do what these coding guys did. Like they all seemed like a bunch of geniuses who really understood computers and could do these magical things. So, you know, I kind of ruled that out for myself. Anyway, I felt this desire rising in me and it was getting stronger and stronger, but I didn't know quite what to do. Along the way around 2012, 2013, I tried to dabble in some code, my first of many attempts, and I failed miserably. I was totally in over my head. And keep in mind, this was before things like Coursera and stuff were mainstream. YouTube was only about eight years old at that point in time. It wasn't the level of information that we have now. And Instagram wasn't a thing. TikTok didn't exist. None of these things that we consider normal today was normal back in 2012, 2013. The world was genuinely a very different place. And it was just 10, 12 years ago, right? And so... While there's plenty of information on the internet, there was no way for me to put it all together. So I kept stumbling around along and doing the wrong things and getting really frustrated and disheartened and discouraged. And so I kept quitting on the coding thing and, and never quite got there. In the meanwhile, I decided I wanted to leave the law. So I guess this is my third career change. First, I went from litigation to corporate law. Then from, from corporate law, I moved into the more business side of things around 2015. I did my MBA at night. So I was working really, really long hours. I did a bunch of leadership training. I moved out of the law into a more commercial role. And I got a lot of phenomenal training, a lot of time in boardrooms and, and really high level executive meetings, see how company strategy is set and how commercial commercial strategies are set, huge learning for me. And then I moved into a role where I was in charge of emerging technology and how to commercialize it. So things like drones and, and the early versions of the blockchain and, and other really, really cool technologies. So that was a really fun time as well. I was still, by the way, failing to code anytime I tried to pick it up. Like I try for two or three months and fail totally, right? Then I was about 36 at this point in time. I was in that executive kind of middle management role. I was earning good money. I got married to the person I'd been with for several years before that. And I just quit my corporate job and said, I'm gonna do my startup. I'm 36 years old. If I don't do it now, I'll never do it. So from there on, I went for two, two and a half years with no income and you know lost more than six figures in the startup. I invested it. We got a lot of users. I, I wasn't technical. I didn't know how to code. I first paid the whole team. To, I paid a lot of money for them to build my product. And then one of them liked it so much and we started getting user traction. And so they decided to come on as a fractional CTO. And a few months later, they quit. By this point in time, I still knew no code. I tried three or four times. And it was very dark and desperate times because I had all these proof of concept contracts with you know local councils and governments and other people to try and prove my product out, which worked really well by the way. But the unit economics, so you know the the commercial model is rubbish, and so I was so desperate to keep it afloat when my CTO quit that I just had to teach myself a bit of code. And that was when I had my breakthrough and I realized, you know what, I think I can actually do this coding thing, even though I'm 37 and a half by this point in time. And so I said, okay, I'm just gonna do it. The startup's gonna die, it's not doing very well. So I shut it down and I ended up going full-time into learning to code. When I say full-time, that's not true because I didn't have money coming in, I had a mortgage. I had spent a lot of money on the startup, six figures, and I hadn't received any income for more than two years. So it was a dark time. And I ended up just saying, you know what? I'm gonna take a massive risk even though I'm doing part-time work and consulting to sort of keep the lights on and pay the rent and mortgage and stuff for that. And things with my, my then wife was starting to get a little complicated, obviously, because of all the stress and this obsession that I was, I was in. Anyway, I took out about a $50,000 loan from the bank uh, against my house. 
and I went to San Francisco for a boot camp. Left that in one week. This was a top rated boot camp in San Francisco. I said, none of these guys actually have any real world experience of what it's like to, to change careers. They know a bit of code, but most of them are boot camp graduates. I can't believe they're the ones who are going to be teaching me. None of these guys actually know how the job market works. So I quit after a week. I lost about $9,000. I came back home to Australia and I got myself a performance coach, somebody I'd worked with previously while I was doing the leadership training. And I said, look, these are my goals. This is what I need to try to achieve. And believe it or not, they helped me become a coder, even though they weren't technical, which just goes to show that the power of the right kind of thinking can help you develop the right plan. Anyway, eight months after this debacle, I was now, what, 38? And I got my first four job offers as a coder after just eight months of being really consistent with the right plan, right? Anyway, that happened at 38. By 39, guys, believe it or not, I applied to Google and I finally got into Google. Now, I say finally because I'd actually applied to Google six times before that in my different careers. But the first time I applied as an engineer, I got through. I made it through and I was an engineer there. It was the crowning glory of my life. And then the pandemic hit and that was a whole disaster and it was hard. But then I learned how to do really advanced remote work, remote engineering, which is very hard for Google. Now, by that time, I'd already worked remotely several times, right? I'd done this as a lawyer starting back in, in 2007 and eight, in the sense that most of my team was located globally. And so I was working across many, many time zones, which is basically remote work. And then I also did a lot of remote work for and working from home during the various stages of my legal and, and business career. And then finally at Google, I was doing it again remotely. And now in my current life at Chainlink Labs, we, you know, we voted one of the best remote places to work in the world because it's a truly remote culture and there's a huge amount of skill involved in working remotely folks so it's really important that we remember that because it's very easy to think that oh I want a remote job but to be honest most people will probably get fired from their remote jobs if they don't have really really good skills that are not what you typically write down on a job description anyway so all of that happened I summarized about a quarter of a century really 25 plus years almost of being in the workforce and it's it's really Really important for folks to understand that career change is absolutely possible at any stage in your life. It gets harder the older you get. There's no doubt about that, but it is possible. And it is always going to be a little bit harder than you secretly hope. There is a price that you're going to have to pay. And often going it alone is the wrong way to do it because the older you get, the less time you have to actually make the change in a meaningful way and get the full benefit of that change. So the longer it takes you, the less time you have in the new life which means speed and time is off the essence. So there's an old saying, and I think it's an old African proverb, that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. And I think it's kind of a little bit of the opposite when you're doing stuff when you're running out of time. So you're often better off working with others or learning from others or getting mentored or getting tutored or something by somebody if you want to get there faster. And when it comes to remote work, I really, really want people to understand I've been doing this for over 10 years now, remote working or you know hybrid working in some form or the other. And I can promise you the kind of skills required are dramatically different. In fact, my podcast, which is on this channel, take a look at it somewhere here. Look for the podcast button. I have an entire episode on the 10 different skills that you really need to get very good at for remote or hybrid working, which I've learned over the last 12 years and arguably before that as well, even when I was working at the UN, a lot of the teams were overseas, right? So when you're doing that kind of work uh, across cultures, across boundaries, the people you've never met before, it's super important for you to master about 10 different skills that I talk about in that podcast, because those skills will make sure you don't get fired and that your performance stays top notch and that you really stand out in your profession. So my biggest learning out of all of this is that most things are harder than we realize, but with the right plan, everything becomes easy. You also definitely do not need to be the smartest person at everything or the technically strongest person in anything. I was never never the technically strongest lawyer. I was never the, sh the, 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 the guy who topped the entrance exams. I never topped school, though I got the highest uh, award in my high school sort of honor, even though I wasn't the, the highest um, ranking or not even close to the highest grades. But it is because I had the most impact. And that's the one thing I've always learned from people that I've, I've seen across my career who are at, at the top. I've had the good privilege of working with CEOs and, and very senior directors of, of big, big companies and some of the finest engineers on the planet when I was at Google. Impact and effectiveness matters much more than sheer raw competence or you know intellectual horsepower. So that's my key lesson and takeaway from the last 20 something years is that you have to figure out how to be effective more than being right or smart or clever all the time. 
get the job done, do it really well, and take the people along with you for a journey. So whether it's a remote work, whether it's engineering, whether it's any career change that you're doing, figure out how to be effective and impactful rather than learning everything you need to learn and, and being the smartest person in the room, which is often quite overrated. Anyway, check out the other stuff in the channel. And if you like, even if you don't like, like and subscribe. No, I'm just kidding. If you like, like and subscribe. Keep me going by sending me comments, give me something to respond to, and I would love to respond to you and, and share everything I know with you guys. All right, take it easy. Bye.